Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Bill Hammer. Uh, I graduated uh, from the GSD in 1968, which is sort of an unfathomable year, long time ago, in urban design. I'm now an architect with my own practice, about a mile from here. And uh, I have been uh, a member of the uh, Alumni Council for the last year. And it's been uh, quite an experience. Uh, when I was a student here, this building didn't exist. We were in Robinson Hall. And I also remember my graduation. Uh, it was the first time it rained in 33 years on a Harvard graduation day. Everyone thought that God smiled down on Harvard until 1968. <laughs> but I'm really happy to welcome uh, all the new graduates here and your families and other alumni um, on behalf of the Alumni Association and, and alumni in general, and welcome you to the Alumni Association. Um, I just wanted to say uh, very briefly, because we'll get on with more interesting speakers, I'm sure. Uh, as alumni, I just want you to know, uh, the Alumni Association really fosters community. There's 16,000 of us, approximately. Um, it's really a big deal. When you get out of here, you're, you're going to realize it's a big deal. And there's an opportunity for you to connect no matter where you are. It's a global community. Uh, it's a community where you can network. It's a community that can be helpful, uh, both personally and professionally. Um, there are two things that you can do as, as alumni, which I think will help you and, and, and help the alumni community. Number one, get involved with your local um, alumni group, wherever that may be. And they really are all over the place. Uh, I understand there's an alumni handbook that's uh, coming out, uh, which will tell you presumably where you can make those connections. But it's worth doing, going to events, supporting events, uh, and hosting uh, wherever you can, helping with portfolio reviews, um, and so forth. And finally, um, the other thing is to give back. Um, it doesn't matter how much. It could be $5, $10, $25, $100, whatever you can do. But it's important to support the school. Uh, for those of you who think that um, Harvard has unlimited resources, uh, Harvard, like every other school, what you paid in tuition, it actually costs more to educate you. And it's important that you remember that and to help particularly future students. So with that, I'm going to step down and turn it over to Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kara Walsh. I'm a graduating MLA One student, um, and it is my great honor to introduce this year's class day speaker, Michael Van Valkenburg. Um, as Michael would appreciate, this will be direct and deliberate uh, <laughs> as much as possible. Um, described recently in Harvard Magazine as probably the most celebrated landscape architect in America, Michael Van Valkenburg is both a designer and an educator. As founding principal of his firm, Michael Van Valkenburg Associates, with offices in both Cambridge and New York, and 80 plus employees, his leadership is described as an extension of his passion for landscape as a living artistic medium that deepens and enriches people's lives through the confluence of aesthetics, technology, and ecology. In practice since 1982, his firm's projects range from, range from small private gardens and plazas to high-profile urban-scale parks in major cities, reflecting both the foundations of landscape architecture as well as its contemporary positioning, positioning as an agent in the making of cities and the driver of urban form. He has received countless accolades and awards for his firm's work, ranging from the restoration of Harvard Yard to the scale of the New Tulsa waterfront as well as Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and Waller Creek in Austin. Um, most notably of late is the immensely popular and highly published Brooklyn Bridge Park, which the New York Times described recently in a review as having a, quote, imme immeasurable effect on New York, much as Olmsted did when he envisioned Central Park. Um, I would read the awards and accolades further, but Michael asked this to not read like an obituary, so move on to say that concurrent to his work and practice, 
Um, his presence here at the GSD has stretched the span of 30 odd years. He is currently the Charles Elliott Professor in Practice of Landscape Architecture, teaching option studios and planting, uh, fundamental planting courses and ecology courses. And he served as the chair of the department from 1991 through 1996. As students, we have felt both his legacy as chair, as well as the influence of his practice as a constant touchstone for inspiration. But beyond these accomplishments and accolades, there is room to reflect on his process as a designer and educator that prove him to be a most fitting choice for class day speaker. While the public side of Michael as a designer is well known, a perhaps lesser known dimension can be found within his offices, which are places that are constantly teeming with creativity of all kinds. He is known for his inclusive working style, where staff of all levels and backgrounds are active makers in process and are given the opportunity to actually design. Education is a constant that is instilled within the office through weekly seminars, as well as the opening of the office to student and organizational tours. Beyond this, his own idiosyncratic passions resound. He is an avid painter, with stacks of canvases steadily stood in his office nooks, having used this medium as a form of expression for over 30 years. He is an obsessive cook, constantly cooking for and in his offices. And he is a true lover of trees and plants. He associates tree tagging as a passion and favorite topic that would only compete with that of his treasured grandchildren. His process of imagination and inspiration reminds us to take cues from influences beyond the limit of our respective disciplines in order to enrich our own creative process. As architects, landscape architects, urban designers and planners, and fundamentally designers, his body of work and his passion should be considered when looking forward to our own futures beyond the GSD as a reminder that creativity is not something that just happens with the confines of a, of a professional office, but that pulses through and can be abstracted from our daily lives. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Van Valkenburg. I'm not sure that this will be a great talk, but either way, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to welcome and acknowledge uh, all the graduating students uh, in the room, uh, and especially their families uh, and relatives who have supported them in innumerable ways. I would say um, there'll be a few bits of advice. I'm going to try to avoid too many platitudes today. Um, but one of the most important ways to be successful in your professional life is to remember and honor the people you have, who have supported you along the way. And today, that starts with the families of all of you who are graduating. I also am very pleased to see um, my faculty colleagues from the school. Um, many administrators, some of whom I've known for 30 years, um, and also Dean Mastafavi. Um, wonderful to have you here this afternoon. Um, I'm not sure uh, about these class speeches. Um, I started getting very nervous about five days ago. I've actually kind of done nothing except worry about giving this. Um, which also would be close to saying I did nothing to prepare the talk except to write notes down in my pad and to, um, and to tear them up. Um, if you want to look up a good class speech after this one disappoints you, try to find John Stilgo's speech about pirates to Harvard College a couple years ago. Um, I don't recommend the one by comedians. Um, I looked those up. They made me very depressed. <laughs> this is a very, this is a very, graduation is a very tender thing for me. I, I taught here full time for, for a very long time. And I loved them for a while. And then, and then I realized what was happening, which was these wonderful, unformed, um, brilliant youngsters, uh, 
were coming to the school and we were beginning to shape them and then we were starting to know them and, and they and they would they would go away and then it started over again the next year and over and over again. So um, it's a happy day for me. I hope I hope this um, talk comes off as happy. Um, but I can't really be funny about it or too funny. Um, and that's because uh, just as a person, my own life is very much about things that move between the real conditions of the world and things that I imagine as a designer. And I suppose that working with some of you as my students and then having you come to the moment of being ready to leave here and go do something else is like the moment that your imagination about making a landscape becomes one of starting to build it. And I'm, I'm, I'm not good at that transition. I love it when it's done. Um, I do want to take a second and thank all of the teachers of the people in this room, and I'll do that by saying a couple of words about some of my teachers. The first one um, was my sixth grade teacher. Her name was Mrs. Haynes, and uh, we were assigned to cover all, I went to public school. Uh, I never went to uh, anything except public schools. We'll talk about that later. But we were assigned to cover our books uh, the first day of classes, and I forgot. It was a new book. So luckily, my name was at the end of the alphabet. And I took my lunch bag, and inside my desk, we had those desks that you slide your hands in, I fashioned a cover for the book. And I went up to show Mrs. Haynes my book. And she looked over at me and said, I saw what you were doing back there. You're very resourceful. We're going to get along just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I had A's the entire year in every subject. It was just crazy. I'm just going to make a couple of other stops. So when I started studying landscape architecture at Cornell, I had a drawing teacher named Ann Elliott. And she was one of those, you know, just one of those teachers that, whose greatness was all about how much she figured out how to reach everybody in the class. And the first day of class, I, I went to public school in rural America. I mean, I never took an art class. Uh, I had art history. I never took an art class. I was terrified she came in. She must have been on heroin. She had like a smile from one ear to the other. It was completely terrifying. <laughs> she comes in and she has a life size, an actual size replica of uh, an Albert Pinkham Ryder painting. Some of you probably know it. It's called Sea and Moonlight, and it's about 14 by 17 inches, and she comes into the room, she's carrying it, she was very beautiful too, which was, you know, another thing. Um, she was carrying this painting, and she comes in, and she puts it on the wall, and we're all sitting there, and she doesn't say anything. She just stands there with this smile on her face, and it, it felt like five minutes. It was probably 15 seconds, but she's standing there, and she just pointed at the painting, and she said, all of that in 14 by 17 inches. And, it, you know, telling you that, I, I feel the goosebumps that I felt from the, the genius of that teacher through her very first act in the class, showing me the potential of everything that she had hoped that we would start to explore um, in her class. And then Lori Olin was never my teacher. Uh, but by great coincidence, he became the department chairman the very year that I was hired. Um, and so we arrived together. In fact, we sat down for our first meeting, and we sat there, and we crossed our legs, and we sort of put our shoes near each other. We had on the same goddamn shoes. It was just like, are you kidding me? Now, the difference between men and women, we like it 
when men wear the same clothes as we do. We're not like, oh, she bought the same dress as me. This is terrible. <laughs> so um, Laurie's amazing. Um, uh, he's amazing. But he said one thing to me as a young faculty member here near, near the end of his short stay as the department chairman. And that was, and in the 1980s, I was making kind of neo-minimal landscapes, kind of like everybody was. I thought I was like Pete Walker. I thought I was like Martha Schwartz, you know. I, you know, I thought I was in the minimalism club. Um, and he said, he, he came to me one day and he said, you know, Michael, I want to talk to you about your work. And, and what was great about him is the way he imparted this incredibly critical thing in a way that was completely disarming and, and made me really interested in what he said. He said, someday you're going to discover complexity and that's going to be the beginning um, of a great period in your work. So I asked, I did, since I, I didn't see Stilgo's talk about pirates, um, by the way, he did the whole male pirate thing and everybody was like, oh God, he's not going to say anything about the fact that half the women in the room are women. And then the whole second half of the talk was about, I mean, who knew, women pirates, you know. <laughs> so, um, so John, I wrote to John, I said, God, you know, I agreed to give this class talk and I'm freaking out, what should I do? He said, tell them about what your life was like when you were their age and immediately afterward. Inspire them that you were, you know, a, a person who was as at the beginning of a career as anybody could be. So I'm, I'm going to try to do that this afternoon. I'm going to make little forays forward. Uh, as as uh, Kara so nicely said, my idiosyncratic qualities are forever present in my work and in my, speaks, in, in my speeches. Um, I would say that I didn't know it, but I would say I spent the first 15 years of my professional life figuring out what I was good at. And I would encourage you to savor the idea that it actually takes a long time in the design disciplines to know what you're good at. And of course, knowing what you're good at um, is um, a difficult thing, especially right after school because you've heard so much stuff from people like me and others. So um, if you, if you, if you want to check out after this talk, tomorrow, well not tomorrow, tomorrow's a busy day, the next day when you wake up, think about, you know, I want to figure out how I'm going to do what Michael said, how am I going to figure out what really we have two expressions in our family, they're both fun, blows your dress up or rolls your socks down. <laughs> um, but uh, whatever it is for you, um, I highly recommend really thinking about that. To explain how I found some of that to you, I want to tell you a little bit about how I discovered landscape architecture. Because I never heard of any of this when I was growing up. When I was 16, my parents um, sold the farm. Like a lot of farmers do, they built a little tiny house uh, on the corner of the farm. And my mom, I guess I was the kid with the green thumb. My mom took me to a tree farm. I never, I didn't know that people grew trees in farms. And, and I went there and I saw this, I can, I can see it right now. There was this row of pin oaks, which is a very mundane tree. I, I use it all the time. It's very common. I saw this row of pin oaks, and we had to pick two for the front of our house. And I felt electricity in my body. I can describe it in no other way. I just was like, oh my god, somebody like made this decision to plant all these trees and the repetitive quality of baby trees all the same size, all in a row. It's just one of the most bizarrely wonderful places in the world to be in a tree farm. So, you know, I went to this place and was like, wow. You know, and that's like, this will happen to all of you in a variety of ways. N not to discover the field. I realize that you've already done that. 
uh, but, but what will happen in the years ahead. And then a year later, my best friend's mom was from, was a, was from Czechoslovakia. And we, were, we actually got permission to go to Europe on the grand tour. They let us take a month off from high school, which was unusual. And um, the first night, we were in Paris. And like all good 17-year-old boys, you know, we went out to dinner with, Bill and I went out with his mom for dinner. And um, we said goodnight, closed the door, waited a little while, went out, bought wine, and went to the Tuileries. And I'm sure most of you know the Tuileries, the trees are in rows, just like in that nursery, except they go, it's a grid, and they go in every direction. And I'm like, oh my god, still no notion that I was going to be a landscape architect. But things, coins are starting to drop into the slot. You know what I'm saying? Like I saw the trees, and then I went to this exquisite creation uh, in, in, in central Paris. And then I entered my freshman year as a history major, and I was forced to take an ecology class. And the professor was retiring, and he kept saying over and over again, oh, I wish I hadn't wasted my life as an ecologist. I wish I had been, what do you think he said? A landscape architect. My antenna went up. The trees are in the tree farm. I'm in the Tuileries. I literally, I, I called my parents and I said, I'm transferring. I'm going to Cornell. I'm going to become a landscape architect. And so I was, eight, I was 18 years old. I mean, and fortunately, it was a great decision. Um, I, I want to say to all of you, you're not entering easy disciplines. But you are entering disciplines that can be deeply rewarding across the expanse of your life. And I would even say to make it worse, it's rather unsatisfactory to be a, at least a young architect or young landscape architect in the beginning of a career. There's a lot of dues to pay, so brace yourself. But if you've had a tough week at the office and you wake up on Saturday morning and the first thing that you want to think about is architecture or landscape architecture, then you've made the right choice. So, so what is it about being a landscape architect or being a designer that that makes it special to me? I want to tell you a story about my granddaughter, Grace. Um, we've had this crazy connection. She was born cesarean, so she came out. She was perfect. You know how, in, have, you, have any of you seen cesarean babies? They look like porcelain dolls. And I looked into the room, and it was like, she, I don't even know if it's true. I don't even know if they can see when they're born. <laughs> but to me, she locked on to me and said, I'm going to own you for the rest of your life. <laughs> Her brother has the same relationship with me, by the way. But he didn't open his eyes for six months, and we thought he was mentally deficient, like, like the way many boys are in the beginning of their lives as babies. <laughs> it all corrects later. So my wife, who's here tonight, um, Caroline, and I were taking Grace to Teardrop Park near our house in Lower Manhattan. And Caroline and I have been married a long time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we argue a lot. What can I say? I mean, I think if people don't argue, they probably get divorced. I don't know. I have to feel that way because, you know, it helps me feel better. Um, so Caroline is... I won't say chiding because she's here. Um, um, Caroline was wondering whether I had enough insurance because she thought there was something in the playground that was too dangerous for Grace to use. So meanwhile, Grace is sitting in the back taking the whole thing in. We get out of the car. Grace is not usually subtle, which is, of course, what something I love about her so deeply. She came around to the car and she grabbed my arm and she said, Boppy, I hope the next time you design a playground, you read the instructions first. <laughs> I 
What's great about being a designer is there are no instructions to read. It's perfectly wonderful for a four-year-old child to think that that's the case. But in fact, what makes design so fantastic is that there, there is no right answer. There is perhaps the best answer, but the best answer to me is different from um, the right answer. I was very lucky, right? I was also lucky because Carl Steinitz, who's on the faculty, was Kevin Lynch's student and loved Kevin. And Kevin was my boss right before I was hired at Harvard. So you, you, you get the picture? Har Carl is here. I'm working for Kevin. Kevin says I'm a good guy. They hire me here. Might, there might be a few other reasons why. But Kevin, I hate to say, Kevin Lynch is a name that too many of you don't know. I just don't know how people that have contributed so much to who we are intellectually as a discipline kind of, they disappear for a while. But Kevin was another one of those, I wish I was a landscape architect people. And when I was leaving his office, he said, you know, Michael, I have one bit of advice for you. The landscape architects who got really great in their careers were the people who made gardens and lots of them when they were young because and my analogy is that it's like cooking you know if you go to a great restaurant and you take pictures of the food you like you just you're not going to just one day make things that you took pictures of it's like a misery to learn how to cook I mean, you cut your fingers and you burn the butter and the pots boil over and, you know, the oven is the wrong temperature and you didn't know that if you put the cookies in at the wrong temperature, they were going to melt rather than rise up and, you know, everything that you have to know. So Kevin, who I adored, and I was 30 when I started teaching here, sent me off. And I, of course, didn't just design gardens for the first... 10 years I was here, I was intensely exploring materiality uh, in every way that I could. And John, John Stilgo went on in his note to me to tell me what my talk should be about and reminded me of all the things from the 80s I forgot. But I was obsessed with ice. Um, why? I don't know. I mean, I grew up in the Catskill Mountains. There were all these clefts of stone. And in the winter, water would run out and freeze and I don't understand the, the chemistry, but it was blue. Nobody was there putting blue dye. It's, you know, it was blue. The water was blue, and it was frozen, and it was immense, and it was just so absorbing when I saw it. And I thought, you know, how could something like that be part of a city? So I started exploring. I, I took garden hoses, and I attached them to the chain link fence behind my house in mid-Cambridge, and then I got NEA grants design exploration grants, and my students, um, I still remember their names, all of them who helped me with it, were out there playing with spraying water and getting wet, and it was ridiculous and insane. But because I was on the tenure track here, I started to write about it, because like, oh God, publisher Paris, you know, I got to, so, you know, I started writing about things, and I started to get recognized for that, and then, there's a logic to all of this, bear with me. I entered a competition in St. Paul, Minnesota for an urban square, and the feature was the first time publicly I had made a proposal for an ice wall. I didn't win, but about six months later, I got a call. It was my birthday, and by the way, on my 34th, 34th birthday, um, the phone rang and you answered it. There was no caller ID. If there was an answering machine, we didn't have one. So, and the phone didn't, by the way, cut off after four rings. It just rang on and on and on and on. So I'm sitting there, and it's my birthday, and I answer the phone. This is Mildred Friedman at the Walker Arts Center. Um, we're thinking of having a competition here at the Walker. Um, but. Half of us want you to win, and the other, other half want Bobby Solomon to win. And before I ask Bobby, because she's even more difficult than I hear you are, 
Would you consider trying to collaborate with her in designing gardens in the conservatories at the Walker Art Center? You know, and I am famous for the big mouth. Um, so I said, well, um, that sounds really interesting, but I hope that there's not an architect who's pretending he's a sculptor. Like, why would I say that? <laughs> she said, well, Frank Gehry is actually <laughs> designing a sculpture for us. But, you know, I'll just forget that you said that. You're going to love his sculpture. You're going to love Frank. And you're going to love working with me. Click. She hung up. And, um, you know, that was, that was it. That was the first commission. But I, 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 I wanted to lead you up to how it happened because it started out with a piece of advice that I ran away with, that I started exploring with, that turned into a competition proposal. And by the way, I entered competitions for 20 years before I ever won one. You know, you are into this. If you're in this field, you're in this for the long haul. There are not a lot of shortcuts. Another thing that I want to talk about is that it was incredible to be a young member of this faculty in the 80s. And particularly, I was preoccupied with Jorge Silvetti's writings um, um, and, and things that he and Rafael Mineo were saying about typologies. And I was damn envious that you couldn't really make the equivalent components of landscape typologically, I thought to the connection to program and for the parents in the room and the people who are still awake. Typology in architecture basically means art museums, excuse me, Jorge, don't, don't you know, I'm tenured so I can't, if I get this wrong, I cannot be thrown out of the school. But churches look like churches for a reason. I mean, that's kind of, is, is that okay? Like churches look like churches, not bad for a landscape architect, okay. <laughs> But it was a fantastic discussion. It was a fantastic discussion going on in the school. And it was also going on with the presence of Harry Cobb and Rafael Maneo, who, for those of you who haven't been graced with critiques by these people, who are as interested in the big ideas of the field as they are the increments of the field. And so there were incredible discussions about materiality. And so in my own work, I forged a relationship between the idea of what I saw as the equivalent, and it really isn't, but, but it, was comparably, it was comparable intellectually to the idea of a typology. And that is that I noticed that through history, people aggregated plants in recurring forms, and that those were related not so much to program like we mean it in architecture, but as we mean it to activity and experience in landscape architecture. And sometimes they're utilitarian, orchard, we all know what an orchard is. Sometimes it's ceremonial, alley, you know, the whole thing. So that is, um, was a great focus of my own work and it, and it remains a passion. Um, I also want to talk about materiality. Um, materiality to me is um, the is um, it's the idea where you deal with your heart and your emotions and your soul when you're a designer, and that's incredibly important for me. Like I get very wrapped up into trying to imagine how a landscape is going to feel. I want to read a quote from Robert Rauschenberg from the '50s. Um, it's a kind of obnoxious quote. Some of you have heard me read it before. I don't really trust ideas, especially good ones. Rather, I put my trust in the materials that confront me because they put me in touch with the unknown. To me, what's really important about landscape is this question of the unknown, of the things. We, it, it, there are many practical and important things that landscape does in the world. It, we, we suppress carbon and we improve the oxygen levels in cities. And, we make hot streets cool with trees and, and things like that. And, and you could really end it there, I suppose. But I'm equivalently interested as a landscape architect in what makes landscape magical to people. 
um, the way that it gives us a particular um, disconnection. Um, I want to talk a little bit um, about Robert Smithson and one of my big mistakes as a young landscape architect. I was too cool to be interested in Frederick Law Olmsted. Um, like Paul, J. Paul Freeberg came and spoke at Cornell when I was like 20. And he was, I didn't, I had never heard of plane trees. You all know what plane trees are, like London plane trees. It's a kind of tree. I thought when he said, I use plane trees in the design, he meant P-L-A-I-N, trees. Like, he uses plane trees, you know, like, great. I don't have to learn all those goddamn trees in that tree class that they want me to take. So for, the, <laughs> for those of you that have... Um, studied plants with me, that's like a rather major um, um, exposure to share with you. Um, I want to talk about the grilled cheese sandwich, um, which, is, uh, which is another way to think about the garden, um, but it's another way to think about starting small and maybe some of you will be so lucky as to start big, but most of you will start small, and it's a great way to begin a design career. Um, you might want to avoid renovating a kitchen as an architect because nobody ever succeeds at that. Um, you put the knife in the wrong place and you failed. Um, but I, had a, I got hired for a really big job a couple of years ago, and I had kind of failed at this little plaza, and a very wealthy man was giving the money to design the plaza. And um, he said, you, don't see, you didn't seem very interested in my plaza, Michael. It would be an embarrassment for me to fire you. But I want to hire Warren Bird, who designed this garden for me and I like. And I want Warren to work for you, and I want him to design this plaza. And we don't want to make a big stink about it, but I just don't think that you care about my little plaza. I don't know where I got this idea in my head, but I said, Peter, I see the whole project as like designing Thanksgiving dinner. You start 10 days ahead of time. You think about the stuffing. Will it be cornbread stuffing or oyster stuffing or will it be simple stuffing? Blah, blah, blah. I see your plaza as like a grilled cheese sandwich. You're home alone with somebody that you love. It's Sunday afternoon. You make the perfect grilled cheese sandwich. It's the beginning of an afternoon of bliss. OK, you're hired. <laughs> I swear. I swear. But um, it's a fun story, or it was fun for me, if not for you. Um, <laughs> it's so important to have those small building blocks, whether they're the gardens that Kevin told me to make, or whether it's your own fascination with um, um, using materials in a particular way. Um, I want to take a second. This is, um, this talk was supposed to be outside, so I couldn't use slides. Um, so this was actually going to be on a series of monitors, and I wasn't sure that you could see it. Um, I, want to, I want to say something about design for me and how I start a design, because that's, I start every design by thinking about what it's not going to be. I, I never know what it's going to be. That would be impossible. But every design is, it can't be this, it can't be that, it's not going to be this. And even that process in itself sometimes tell me, tells me what it is. But if this room were illuminated slightly differently, you would see that the pattern in the paving is a mix of black bricks. I don't like irony in design, by the way. But this is actually done for somewhat ironic reasons, besides the fact that, that manganese bricks are extremely beautiful. Since there's so much damn brick in Boston, I thought it would just be great to make a garden out of black brick. Now, like, see, nobody laughed. But I'm like rolling around in my office when I had this idea. And they're all, 
they're all laughing, not with me. They're laughing at me in the office, which is allowed and necessary. But so this is how this design was made more complicated by my interest in materiality. The gardener is filled with tapestries. And somebody, uh, an intern, I forgot his name. He was in your class. Yes, yes. Are, is he here? <laughs> you had this cool idea of taking the weaving of the tapestries, remember? Of course you remember. It was my idea. He's like, what's he talking about? <laughs> But he had this great idea that we would enlarge the increment of the tapestry and it would somehow inform the patterning of the bricks. Because black brick is kind of stupid. You know, it's a beautiful material, but it becomes very dull and unanimated when it's continuous. And so there was this idea of borrowing the notion of weaving. Soon after that, I'm walking down a street in my neighborhood, a, a bluestone street, and somebody has patched the sidewalk with schist. Schist is this exquisite opposite of a black. Um, and yet, the effect when you put them together isn't opposing at all. It's an extremely wonderful companion. Um, I have to talk about chance a little bit. I want to proceed it by saying, I hate it when people say there's no such thing as luck. I love it when people understand the idea that you make your own luck in the beginning of your career, which means that you need to have your antenna available and make those connections to the things that you already know that you love. I want to just share a couple of chance things from my career, and I'm almost finished. There are two other original principles of MVVA, Laura Solano and Matt Urbanski. Now, how is this for chance? Laura is the wife of my first employee, who hasn't worked for me for 20 years, by the way. And Matt, who was my student, but who was really wild as a student, like really wild, never did, never did anything. I, like, he was like the end of me giving desk crits because it was one of those, you know, you go to his desk and then he comes back and he's just done the whole thing. I ran into him in an elevator. And we were having a charrette in the office and we needed some help. And I remembered he was good with models. I'm like rolling my eyes the whole time. God, I'm inviting this feral animal. It's not really how I felt, but... Um, I'm inviting this feral animal. He'll build some models and he'll get the hell out. And, uh, you know, he and Laura came through completely different routes. We are inseparable, I think, as the foundation of the firm. And you've made some of those connections with your friends here at school, and you'll continue to make those in the time that's ahead. I'm going to end by doing something very passe which is to talk a little bit about Frederick Law Olmsted. Most of these notes are from Witold Rybczynski's book, uh, which is very easy reading. In other words, it's not a tremendously scholarly book, but just a really great way to get to know the guy. It's called A Clearing in the Distance. And first of all, it's important to know that he had three or four careers before he won the competition to design Central Park. He was born in 1822. When he was 15 to 18, he was a land surveyor. He never went to college. He was a, 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 a deck mate on a sail, sailing ship that went around South America and to China and back. Can you imagine what that was like in 1850? Apparently, he vomited for 18 months doing that. Um, he had an illustrious career as a writer. He was probably the seminal figure in American intellectual history, um, successfully advocating for the abolition of slavery through his travels in the South and his multiple books that he published, starting in 1852 and continuing all through the first several years that he was designing Central Park. In 1857, he teamed up with Calvert Fox, that's how we say it, um, to win the competition. Now I want to come back to a couple of things that we've talked about. 
first of all, um, this is a person who knew what he was good at and he knew what he wasn't good at, which is another version of me saying, explore what you're good about. He could not draw, and Vox was a magnificent renderer. And so he didn't choose somebody like himself to be his partner. He chose somebody who was complementary to his skills. It so happened that the, the idea of Central Park was not Olmsted's. There was a, almost a 10-year debate in New York City about what it would take to make New York City the premier city um, in America and the notion of the library system, sanitation, the roads, and parks uh, were imagined by William Jennings Bryan and a whole series of other people. It's so interesting, however, to think about Olmsted's career. Right after he started designing the park, he went into the Civil War. He invented something that's not unlike the Red Cross. He moved to California. He ran a gold mine. He started designing landscapes a couple of years later. He was fired and rehired for Central Park three times before it was completed 30 years later. What's amazing, though, about Central Park is a work of landscape architecture, and really why we think so highly of Olmsted besides the significance of Central Park is that Central Park has basically been completely redesigned and reinvented in every superficial way three times since it was completed late in the 19th century. And yet, the work, the integrity of the work, its circulation, the essence of its organization, and its general characters of a landscape are as visible today as they were when the landscape was completed. That is a measure of a great work of landscape architecture. Um, I can't imagine if you, well maybe, I don't know what I, I don't know, but if you were a young artist today and I was teaching you, I would suggest that as a person going to the museum, there probably weren't rooms that you should skip. You don't have to be entranced by the pre-Raphaelites, but you probably should stop in there to get a little piece. I feel the same way about the history of landscape architecture because it's um, so rich and extraordinary. Um, I, I want to um, end the talk by saying thank you to my many colleagues here in the school over the years. Um, my very first gathering with senior faculty was when they were interviewing me, and I went over to an acting um, department chairman's head, I think Rick, uh, House, I think Richard Foreman was also there, maybe, but was hadn't quite said yes. No, that was later. Richard wasn't there, but Carl was there. The head of the department was an ecologist, and they both drank way too many martinis, like, wow, like, like it was a gaseous vodka in the room. There was a raging war about whether landscape architecture paved the way to hell with good intentions. And it was the debate of save the world, save the soul. You prob I'm, I don't want to not save the world, but you probably figured out by now I'm more interested in saving the soul. We call it the Pierre Michael syndrome in the department. Save the world, Pierre. Save the soul, Michael. Anyway. Um, lastly, I want to say like why would somebody teach for 32 years at the GSD? And it's because of all of you. Um, I, I, I taught in the first year. The students are, and it's partly because there's so many more of them, so there's that much more chance for greatness. But they're the greatest, they're the greatest students in the school now that, that I've ever experienced. And my studio, Joe, Kunkuk, Clay, Manuel, Fan, Takuya, Jean, Bin Bin, Michaelis, um, Michelle, Fred, Hang, and Hayoon, the people in my studio that I taught with Rosetta and Gulliver Shepherd, are the people that give me confidence about the quality of the world that we all will live in in the future. Thank you very much.